A preseason injury to Cincinnati quarterback Ken Anderson's hand has turned the once favored Bengals into little more than hungry alley cats in the AFC Central. This injured paw has also led to rumors that head coach Bill Johnson's job is dangling precariously at the end of a very slim thread. Last week before the Pittsburgh game, his 0-2 record had made his season a walk in a nightmare thus far. Of course, Pittsburgh's frightening steel curtain defense was not about to let a walk in a nightmare become a stroll in the park for Cincinnati. Some experts felt the Steelers were a team in decline, perhaps to be passed by both the Bengals and the Oilers in this year's final standings. But far from declining, before last week's games, the Steelers were 2-0 and sharing top spot in the AFC Central with yet another surprising team. Yes, Cleveland's coach Sam Ratigliano can afford to smile. Even last week, although quarterback Brian Sipe was playing with a slightly injured left wrist and Greg Pruitt was out with a bruised thigh, the Browns felt they had the firepower on offense to blast the mortar out of the Atlanta Falcons' stonewall defense. And for a coach who was supposed to be feeling his way, Sam Ratigliano had to be feeling proud. Now we'll watch the AFC Central take on an unexpected look as the Steelers meet the Bengals and the Browns meet the Falcons in an NFL doubleheader game of the week. In Atlanta, the Browns got the ball first and were immediately speeding along end zone bound. However, a penalty, a gradually toughening Atlanta defense and their own mistakes, not only stalled the drive, but put the Falcons in the driver's seat. When number 30 fullback Cleo Miller fumbled, the Falcons were quick to pounce on the loose ball. With number 14, June Jones, at quarterback, Atlanta launched a drive that almost made the most of the opportunity. A pass to receiver Billy Reichman brought the Falcons to the Browns' seven-yard line. Then June had most of September to throw a perfect scoring strike to tight end Jim Mitchell, number 86. Now, it is unusual for Jim Mitchell to miss a ball like that. And as the repeat shows, there is no discernible explanation. In grandstand vernacular, he should have had it, but he didn't. So the Falcons settled for three on a Fred Stein for 24-yard boot. <music> Meanwhile, the Atlanta defense had been dipped in starch and stiffened accordingly. When the Falcons got the ball, the Browns also yielded only meager amounts. So unable to do it in the dirt, Jones moved to the airways where number 86 linebacker Gerald Irons intercepted, fumbled, and was saved by number 27 safety Tom Darden. Now it was Don Cockroft's turn, and on the first play of the second quarter, he nodded the score from 43 yards out. Mistakes continued to plague Atlanta. This punt by John James was marked for a fair catch, but number 45, Tom Moriarty, got in the way, and the resulting penalty put the ball on the Atlanta 32-yard line much to the dismay of a quickly formed group of finger pointers. With this kind of break, Sipe was ready to cook. The recipe called for one 23-yard pass to wide receiver Dave Logan, which served to preheat the end zone. Then on a nicely executed play fake and a huge measure of protection that must have brought the Falcon defense to a boil, Sipe sliced the pass down the middle to first-year tight end Ozzie Newsom. The two-yard score was a piece of cake and put the Browns on top, 10 to 3. A repeat shows that Sipe's textbook play fake initiated confusion amidst the Atlanta linebackers and pulled everyone up toward the line of scrimmage to make the scoring catch easy for Ozzie.
Unwilling to let the Brownies skate away, Jones came right back. Over the middle to Mitchell was good for 18. Then Jones handed off to halfback Haskell Standback, who hit the hole, cut outside, and was end zone bound. A repeat shows that it was Standback's quickness on the 15-yard romp that left the pursuit grasping for air and gasping at the 10-10 score. Now it was time for a little Cleveland daring. Sight threw a less than crushing block, but did screen the Falcon linebacker and allow wide receiver Reggie Rucker to run for first down yardage. A quick pass to Newsom, who cleared into the right flat, left the Browns 27 yards out, a distance that required but one play to cover. Again, Sipes' protection was enduring, and he arched the scoring strike right down the middle to Rucker. A repeat shows that the usually potent Falcon rush must have taken a wrong turn outside of Plains, Georgia, because on this particular play, it wasn't worth peanuts. Or perhaps the Browns' offensive line is better than most people know. At any rate, Cleveland now led 17 to 10, going into the second half. The third period was one for the defenses. Neither team scored, while both quarterbacks suffered a light shower of minor embarrassments. While Sipe was able to weather his misfortunes, June Jones was not so lucky. He was replaced by number 10, Steve Bartkowski, the once and perhaps future king in Atlanta. The move made sense when Wallace Francis came up with a great leaping, stealing reception. But misinterpreting the ref's signal, he then took off for greener pastures. Despite the overflow of enthusiasm, the catch was allowed, but the touchdown was not. The drive petered out, and a field goal attempt failed. In the fourth quarter, the game became as tense as a snare drum roll when Sipe was hard hit fumbled and the Falcons recovered. Bartkowski was getting fortress-like protection and firing bullseyes to Billy Reichman from the parapets. Rookie runner Ray Strong charged in from the two, but the point after was missed and Atlanta trailed 17 to 16. Sensing that it might be slipping away, Seif unloaded a perfect pass and catch routine to Ricky Feature number 83. That was good for 42 yards. It was an inspiring catch that led to a less than picture perfect fumble and pick up and two yard score by Seif that sealed the Browns third win 24 to 16 and left them undefeated atop the AFC Central. All that remained was some final policing action, which was accomplished when Tom Darden stopped the Falcons' last-ditch scoring effort. The 
Browns are a surprise, but they won't sneak up on Pittsburgh this week because with their 3-0 record, they're beginning to look suspiciously like contenders rather than long shots. But maybe Coach Sam Rattigliano will have something up his sleeve to stymie the steel curtain. Like Brian Seip, Kenny Anderson is nursing a sore hand, but his is different in one big respect. It is his passing hand, and it continues to keep the Bengal quarterback in street clothes on Sunday afternoons. In Anderson's customary spot stands John Reeves, who the week before very nearly led Cincinnati to a victory over the Browns. But if he hopes to notch his and the Bengals' first win of 1978, it will have to be against the Steeler team that this season appears to have recaptured all the might and majesty of Pittsburgh's back-to-back -back Super Bowl winning teams. Steeler quarterback Terry Bradshaw has already overcome an injury, a broken nose sustained in Pittsburgh's first preseason game. And after two weeks, number 12 leads the AFC in passing, but it was running, not throwing, that helped move the Steelers to a quick touchdown. When on the game's first play from scrimmage, Frank O'Hara snapped off a 37-yard run. It was the beginning of an almost perfect day for Pittsburgh, as Harris and Rocky Blyer, number 20, gained 55 yards of a 63-yard in-your-face drive to the end zone. The two Steeler backs, who once both gained 1,000 yards in the same season, would carry the ball 28 times against the Bengals, combining for 148 yards rushing, with Blyer scoring the Steelers' first touchdown, skirting Cincinnati's left flank from five yards out. The Steelers had cut through the Bengal defense like a blowtorch through balsa wood. Their drive to a seven to nothing lead had been keyed by their very first play. It promised a successful afternoon. Cincinnati's first play from scrimmage, however, was a disaster. And for the Bengals, unfortunately, it too was an omen of things to come. Rookie cornerback Ron Anderson's diving interception of Reeves' first pass gave the Steelers possession near midfield, and had come as a result of a near sack by L.C. Greenwood, which forced Reeves to throw the ball high and up for grabs. Both Steeler units had begun the game with spectacular successes, and the Pittsburgh offense picked up right where it had left off, this time with Bradshaw getting 47 yards worth of passes to Lynn Swan that had Pittsburgh poised to score again. The Steelers' second score had come as easily as the first. Looking at Harris' 15-yard run from the end zone reveals that Harris, like Blyer, was untouched as the Steeler offensive line blew out the middle of the Bengal defense. Less than six minutes into the game, Pittsburgh led 14 to nothing. The defense had created a turnover on its only play, and the offense had shown it could move at will. All units were working well, and the Steelers weren't above calling on a little luck either. Tight end Benny Cunningham came up with a pinball reception that was certainly a Steeler broken play, as both wide receivers were in the same exact spot, not your usual garden variety pass patterns that call for receivers to spread out the secondary, not draw it together. At this point, the Steelers could have named the final score, but the well-oiled machine soon began to cough, sputter, and spit out extra parts. Three turnovers in the first half gave the Bengals a chance to come back. The first came with the Steelers on the Bengals' 15-yard line, a Cunningham fumble that linebacker Reggie Williams returned 30 yards. Instead of the Steelers going in for a third score and burying the Bengals right then and there, the Tigers made out all right and used the turnover to move to their first and only score of the day. 
as Reeves completed three passes and scrambled for a painful 10 that led to a field goal and a 14-3 score. The Steelers made every effort after that to let the Bengals off the mat. Williams added an interception to his fumble recovery, and Scott Perry recovered another fumble, halting two consecutive Steeler possessions. But despite the fact that the Bengals started those two possessions from the Steeler 40 and 37 yard lines, they could not add to their point total, as the Steel Curtain bailed out their buddies on the offense by allowing a total of just 10 yards after the two turnovers. In effect, that was the ball game. Having blown two real chances, the Bengals would never get into the game. They had scored just three points after claiming three turnovers. And even after their one score, rookie Larry Anderson exhibited another element of Steelers' strength in 78. The Steelers are loaded everywhere. Offense, defense, special teams, and a new weapon, third-year tight end Cunningham, who is beginning to become a force in the Steeler attack, with four receptions for 107 yards against the Bengals. Terry Bradshaw claims the new pass defense rules will turn Cunningham into a terror. One bump isn't going to slow down a 6'5", 250-pound man, says Bradshaw. Cunningham went 48 yards, took a breather for one play, then made a breathtaking catch to put the Steelers on top 21 to three at halftime. The Steelers spent the second half honing their execution and executing the Bengals. They would outgain Cincinnati 447 yards to 179 and out first down their Central Division rivals 26 to 9. Except for four turnovers, the Steelers were a textbook example of good football. Looking at this tight end screenplay again, watch number 84, Randy Grossman, the Steelers' Jewish bomber, as he delays at the line by semi-blocking number 78, Ted Vincent, then slipping behind the screen blockers. Like most of the Pittsburgh plays, Grossman's game was playbook perfect. While about the only thing Cincinnati did worthy of publication was a textbook example of pass interference, as Lewis Breeden hit Lynn Swan a bit early, and none too subtly, for a 40-yard penalty. Of course, sometimes that's about all you can do against one of pro football's premier wide receivers, who snatched Bradshaw's second touchdown pass of the day from 12 yards away. Bradshaw would finish the day 14 for 19 for 242 yards, leading the Steelers to a 28 to 3 lead. Had it not been for Pittsburgh's penchant for playing hot potato, there's no telling what the final outcome would have been. But the Steeler defense never let the Bengals take advantage. Led by middle linebacker Jack Lambert, number 58, the Pittsburgh defense matched the performance of their offense, and the game was not as close as the 28-3 final score would indicate. The Steelers were simply too much for the Bengals last week, and too ready for anything Cincinnati threw at them. On the Steelers' sideline, it was time to settle back with a good chaw for a job well done. A time to smile, a time to unwrap the armor and put the wraps on the finest Pittsburgh performance in some time. 
They were Dominators again, harboring very real dreams of a return to the Super Bowl. So take notice, NFL, the Steelers are scary again. After their 28-3 defeat by the Steelers, the Bengals are 0-3, three games behind the undefeated Steelers and Browns who play each other this week in a crucial AFC Central Division matchup. <laughs>